This video is brought to you by Wix. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the films of Quentin Tarantino? Is it Travolta having a legendary comeback while wearing one of the most stylish wigs of all time? Or BJ Novak leaving his temp job at Dunder Mifflin to go hunt Nazis? Or is it just an inspiring cacophony of Samuel L. Jackson yelling the F word? English, mother do you speak it? I bet whatever you pictured, it wasn't a comprehensive subversion of the logic of slavery. And that's why today we're talking about Django Unchained, a movie that has all the typical Tarantino hallmarks that we love, while also giving us an incredibly clever, nuanced, and, dare we say, fun criticism of slavery. So join us as we break down the fastest and flyest gun in the West in this wisecrack edition on Django Unchained, subverting the logic of slavery. But before we jump in, wanna give a shout out to our sponsors over at Wix. As I mentioned before, I used Wix to create a free professional looking website to promote my voiceover work. People always told me I had a good voice for that kind of stuff, but I never really thought of myself as a performer. But after doing all these Wisecrack videos, I decided to use Wix to see if I could take something I really like doing and turn it into something legit. All I had to do was tell the interface my experience with creating a website, pick a design I liked, and boom, now my voice is profitable. No matter what you need a website for, Wix will give you the ability to take that passion, skill, or business to the next level. So head to wix.com wisecrack to easily get started for free. And now, back to the show. All right guys, a quick recap is in order. Django Unchained follows a captured runaway slave, Django, who gets rescued and taken under the wing of genteel German bounty hunter King Schultz. After teaching him his craft and making some good money in the process, Schultz accompanies Django on a mission to rescue his wife Brumhilda from one of the most vile villains in recent cinema, plantation owner Calvin Candy. Now, one way to make an anti-slavery movie is to make revenge porn about a former slave burning down a southern plantation. So, yeah, check. But beneath the classic Tarantinoisms, Django provides three far more subtle commentaries on slavery. Part one, you can't cover ugly with civilization. Surprisingly, Django Unchained offers a purpose to language beyond a vehicle in which one crams as many as possible. I don't want to hear no these, excuses, man. I ain't giving you fucking excuses, man, and I'm telling you, I don't fucking, I'm giving you fucking reason. That's because from the perspective of slavers like Big Daddy and Calvin Candy, white bodies represent culture and civilization, while black bodies are seen as uncivilized and incapable of proper use of language and appreciation of culture. Enter Schultz. This eloquent German speaks English as a second language so well that it confounds the native speaking slavers. Yeah, he needs to have panache. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, 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 panache. Uh, a sense of showmanship. Showmanship, yes. And, well, let's just say it's not his accent. So I wish to parlay with you. Speak English. His mastery of English vocabulary confuses those around him multiple times. My good man, I'm simply trying to ascertain. Speak English, goddammit. Meanwhile, his rhetorical skills allow him to talk circles around the simpletons of the American South. But I'm willing to wager this man was elected sheriff sometime in the past two years. Schultz disrupts the racist binary we just discussed by making these self satisfied Southerners look wildly uncivilized by comparison. He's basically an emblem of the mythical European civilization that American men of means built their plantations on. And he's the walking reminder that these self-styled men of culture are, well, they're full of shit. The idea that slaves were incapable of proper language goes way back to Aristotle. For Aristotle, humans differed from animals based on logos, a Greek word meaning both speech and reason. By contrast, my dog Woody can only communicate by phonos, the yapping and barking that can only communicate fear, displeasure, and hunger, as well as other basic instincts. More importantly, Aristotle used this to justify slavery in Greece because they were, in his mind, only capable of receiving and understanding logos, but not possessing it. In other words, slaves weren't capable of proper speech and the reason that came with it. And not surprisingly, this language-based justification for slavery and racism just never died. Django takes this dichotomy and flips it. Some of the cruelest slavers mumble so incoherently that they make Post Malone sound articulate. Contrast that with the clearly intelligible slaves. They walked us from the Greenville auction and he rode in on a horse with a white man. At every opportunity, the film contrasts how Schultz treats slaves with how every other white person does. Unlike his peers, Schultz uses the honorific Frau line when talking to Brumhilde instead of the N-word. 
Candy, however, demands the French honorific Monsieur as a sign of respect. And he prefers Monsieur Candy to Mr. Candy. Si c'est cela qu'il préfère. He doesn't speak French. Don't speak French to him. It'll embarrass him. Whereas Schultz uses titles as a form of voluntary respect, Candy uses them as mandatory submission. Now, we can see a similar dynamic with the way that the film uses beer. Early in the film, Schultz buys, well, steals Django a beer. And this seems to symbolize the transition from a free man and slave relationship to a couple of co-workers having a cold one after a long day's work. Later in the film, we see Candy order a beer for one of his fighters after a victory, but this exchange doesn't have the same Cheers-esque vibe. Instead, Candy is using beer as a sick sort of reward for an enslaved man forced to literally murder another man for the enjoyment of two slave owners. One beer represents shared humanity, while the other represents cold-blooded savagery. You enjoy that boy. Now, at the same time, even the multilingual European man of culture isn't all that civilized. For one, he's a bounty hunter who literally kills people for a job. The way the slave trade deals in human lives for cash a bounty hunter deals in corpses. And while he isn't a fan of owning people, he still buys Django for his own self-interest and more or less forces him into helping him out. On one hand, I despise slavery. On the other hand, I need your help if you're not in a position to refuse all the better. Though unlike the others, he at least acknowledges that this isn't a moral act, just a pragmatic one. We see the contrast between Schultz and the faux civilized white Southerners at its peak once we're introduced to Calvin Candy, I mean, Monsieur Candy, a title he demands even though he doesn't speak or understand French. Oh, and he has the hots for his sister. Candy even tries to show off his German to Schultz, but well, he doesn't quite nail it. I'll have a beer. I want a bar, I want a bar. I want a bar. And while Schultz manages to play his part while letting Candy look like a jackass, he reaches his boiling point when a woman starts playing Beethoven on the harp. After having a flashback about what he'd seen earlier, Schultz can no longer deal with having a beautiful product of his culture appropriated by people who are truly savages. Could you please stop playing Beethoven? And while we're on the topic of some of Europe's most notable exports to the colonies, it's worth mentioning how the Christian Bible, the book meant to signify proper European religion, was used to justify slavery. We see this in action when Django is on his first bounty job at Big Daddy's plantation and comes upon one of the Brittle brothers literally quoting the Bible while preparing to whip a slave. And the Lord said, the fear of ye and the dread of ye shall be on every beast of the earth. Not only this, he has a page of the Bible pinned to his shirt over his heart, which serves as a great target for Django to put a bullet through. It's as if Django's shot points out the bloody hypocrisy of using Christianity to justify savagery. I like the way you die, boy. Maybe you couldn't recognize the verse Brittle was reciting, but it was Genesis 9 verse 2. When God gives mankind power over all the beasts, birds, fish, etc., a perfect justification for slavery if you think that slaves are less than human. Part two, using the symbols of slavery to make slavery look stupid. While language and culture are the most obvious ways in which the film is on slavery, we can also see how it uses everything from fashion to music to iconography to further flip the logic of slavery on its head. One way to understand what Tarantino is doing is to consider Joseph Cinque, leader of the Amistad Rebellion. Cinque led a revolt in which a group of illegally purchased slaves took control of the Amistad back from their Spanish captors. Cinque and his comrades became surprising folk heroes even as they fought charges of mutiny and murder. Now importantly, Cinque was portrayed in media in the style and fashion of a noble from the culture that enslaved him. In one newspaper, he was sketched in buccaneer's clothes, striking a gallant pose with a cane knife he used to murder his captors. Historian Marcus Redeker describes this depiction and others as egalitarian and subversive. Meanwhile, abolitionists accuse the Spanish slavers as being savage pirates. We see something similar happen in the movie when Schultz gives Django a makeover and he comes out dressed like one of the three musketeers. You mean you want to dress like that? But this isn't just the setup for a joke. Django's attire is deliberately abrasive for anyone who would reserve such an outfit for a white civilized man of culture. This and Django's horseback riding, an activity historically associated with the well-to-do, draws ire or surprise from everyone around him. <laughs> And of course, in one of the film's final scenes, Django takes out Steven's knees and leaves him in a plantation-shaped powder keg on a horse while wearing Candy's clothes. Django's aesthetic choices in some ways resemble what theorist Jose Esteban Munoz called disidentification. 
For Munoz, disidentification is a strategy of acting against a dominant ideology that does not simply try to escape it or assimilate within it. Rather, one takes the cultural logic of, say, slavery and mangles its symbols from within. Django does not don the attire of a Southern aristocrat to become one, but rather to abuse the very notion of the Southern gentleman. We see a similar logic in the work of artist Kahinda Wiley, who would paint Harlem residents in the style of classic European art. Tarantino also plays with the soundtrack to emphasize how Django flips the script on all types of cultural expectations, and uses what might seem out of sync with a Western set in the mid-19th century, rap music. I need a honey black chocolate for a honey bad me and a honey black grape so I can lay their ass see. But this choice makes perfect sense when we consider that rap music has long been used by those in positions of racial and economic inequality to call on people to, as Public Enemy so beautifully put it, we got to fight the power of that beat. With this power often being the type of systematic white supremacy rooted in the history of American slavery. Rap music has often been used to fantasize about both changing one's circumstances and seeking revenge for this injustice along the way. So it makes sense that the song that Rick Ross and Jamie Foxx wrote for this film, A Hundred Black Coffins, has lyrics like, My revenge is the sweetest, bitch cause I'm coming. Gotta die in my arms for what you did to my mother. So what seems like a weird juxtaposition of genre and soundtrack ends up being the perfect way to highlight Django's journey of seeking power and revenge under conditions of oppression. Now to move from rap to opera, and no we're not talking about Hamilton, music is also used by Schultz to give context to Django's journey to save his wife. Using Richard Wagner's Twilight of the Gods, the fourth and final opera in his The Ring of the Nibelung, Schultz interprets Django's attempt to rescue Brumhilde in a way that makes Django the Siegfried of his own story of revenge. Plus, when a German meets a real-life Siegfried, that's kind of a big deal. As a German, I'm obliged to help you on your quest to rescue your beloved Brumhilde. Wagner's opera can also be read via the lens of his friend then enemy, or friend enemy, Friedrich Nietzsche, whose Twilight of the Idols is a nod to Wagner's Twilight of the Gods. It's not a stretch to say that Wagner's Siegfried can be read as a Nietzschean ubermensch, one who responds to a nihilistic lack of values by powerfully creating new ones. So if Django is the Siegfried of the film, he is also a sort of ubermensch who responds to the nihilist values of slavery and white supremacy, not with rational appeals to reform and dialogue, but by both metaphorically and literally burning the whole damn thing to the ground. Much like how the whole world burns down to start anew for Wagner, in Django Unchained, the fiery destruction of Candyland can be seen as a metaphorical call for the destruction of the institution of slavery in general. It's also highly unlikely that the guy who made Inglorious Bastards isn't also aware that Wagner's Ring Cycle was basically the soundtrack for German nationalism. One cannot understand National Socialism if one does not understand Wagner. So he's using a narrative once appropriated by the Nazis to support white supremacy to tell a slavery revenge narrative that destroys white supremacy. Not bad. And in one final act of symbolic subversion, Tarantino uses the Western to frame this slave revenge fantasy. And in case you haven't seen many Westerns, they usually consist of strong-jawed white dudes like John Wayne killing off villainized Native Americans while making brothel workers swoon. In Django Unchained, the white cowboy types are instead taken out by a freed slave, a subject largely ignored in the Western canon. Part three, acting out of slavery. The final way we can consider how slavery is subverted in the film will bring pride to the heart of all the theater kids out there as it's a consideration of the role of acting. And don't worry, we're not talking about how Leo should have won an Oscar. The type of acting we're talking about is related to the agency of individuals. There's a ton of academic debate about the question of agency in slavery. While some imagine that slaves had their humanity stripped away so fully that they were completely lacking in any agency and autonomy, others explore the kinds of freedom slaves were able to exert. There are tons of historical examples of small or big actions slaves took in the name of resistance. Work slowdowns, arson, straight up murder, etc. But of course the retaliations for these acts of rebellion were so horrific that many would have been justifiably dissuaded from these acts of freedom. In Django Unchained, acting is the primary means by which Django has agency. We see this as Schultz prepares Django for their mission to trick Candy and save from Hilda. You'll be playing a character. 
And of course, Django even has a wardrobe for this character, as we previously mentioned. We see Django's agency expressed by the decisions he makes while acting out this role. He's put in a position to both berate other slaves, lash out at Candy's crew, and even sit by approvingly as a runaway slave is ripped apart by dogs. And it's important to note here that Django's decisions are neither good or bad, but rather the decisions he gets to make within the scope of the limited agency he's granted. He doesn't choose to treat Candy slaves poorly out of hatred, but out of the necessity of his own survival. This acting range comes in handy later when Django has to outsmart a gang of Australians to regain his freedom and complete his mission. He plays a part and even uses props. I got the handbill right here in my pocket if you let me get it. Get it in. To put on such a convincing performance that the Aussies literally hand him a gun. But maybe the most striking example of agency through acting is Candy's head house slave, Steven. Now, Steven really, really hates Django. Like, a lot. He gonna stay in the big house? And this is likely a hatred born of envy, as while Steven has worked his ass off to become as powerful as possible within the system of slavery, Django has gained freedom through breaking out of that system altogether. But one thing they do have in common is their shared employment of the dramatic arts for personal gain. Steven has performed his way out of the harsh labor of the fields and into the relative comfort of Candy's home, and has even gotten to the point where he can snap back and disagree with his master. Take it out, why? And like a new boyfriend trying too hard to impress their parents around the holidays, Steven laughs way too hard at Candy's stupid jokes. Well, hell, I can't imagine two weeks in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks in Boston. I've been joking. Two weeks, man. <laughs> Two weeks in Boston. But unlike an insecure boyfriend, Steven knows exactly what he's doing. And he uses this performed laughter to gain trust and influence. And this influence is on full display when it's Steven, not Candy, who realizes that Schultz and Django have been playing them the whole time. They ain't here for no muscle bound Jimmy. They here for that girl. Steven is a student of nonverbal acting as well, performing a fake limp, which necessitates a fake cane so that he appears physically weak. This disarms any suspicion anyone might have about Steven being skilled or powerful. While Steven is definitely a sort of villain, as even Django treats him to the same fate as the white slavers, it's important to see this villainy in the larger context. Is Steven a bad dude who served the interest of his white master over those of the fellow slaves? Absolutely. But did he have any other way to get some sort of freedom under the conditions of slavery? Probably not. And for all we know, Stephen never had the luxury of a fake German dentist showing up to free him and teach him how to shoot his way to freedom. Stephen is simply trying to manifest his own power, playing the cards he was dealt, and those cards truly suck. So there you have it. A movie that you might have dismissed as Tarantino's irreverent attempt to make a slavery western, is in fact one of the sharpest criticisms of slavery and of white supremacy in recent cinema. And most importantly, it answers the all-important question, what would it be like to see a young Jonah Hill play a member of a pre-KKK hate group wearing poorly cut out sheets on their heads as they ride horses? Thanks for watching guys, and if you wanna build your own website for free, check out Wix using the links in the description. And as always, peace.